Okay, uh, hi everybody on Facebook Live. This is Emily. I'm at Alpine Shop Kirkwood. Uh, we're getting ready for uh, AR 101 class number two. We're going to talk about paddling and clothing tonight. Um, so just wanted to say hi. Thanks for watching. We may basically talk to our amazing audience here in Kirkwood. A um, little fewer people than last slide, but it's actually snowing here. So uh, smart, fewer but smarter. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's snowing here, so if you're tuning in from home because you don't want to drive, I get it. Uh, just make sure you still join us on race day. Um, okay, so hi everybody. Um, Earl's getting markers and stuff, so they'll be here uh, shortly. And I think everybody, most people were here last week, so I met everybody, right? Um, okay, so uh, I will do kind of a brief introduction a little shorter than last week. Um, my name is Emily. I'm the co-race director for the adventure race, the Castlewood Adventure Race on December 1st. This will be my fourth year, me and Earl's fourth year doing putting the race on together. Um, and it'll be the 13th year overall that the race has happened. So one of the longest running races in the Midwest. Um, definitely in the longest one in Missouri. And this year it's going to be the biggest one in Missouri, and actually one of the biggest in the country because we have uh, 300 people signed up. So, pretty excited about that. Um, Earl, do you want to do a quick intro? <laughs> You're in? Yep, I'm here. Hi, my name is Scott Erlinson, and most people call me Earl. Um, I'm like basically duplicating everything that Emily's done over the last four years. And I'm super passionate about the adventure racing and super excited that uh, we're able to put together a really super fun course this year and we're going to have a great field of participants from there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about paddling and clothing. Um, so let's see. So basically the, the overview of how paddling works at the Castlewood Adventure Race. Um, we use, everybody gets the same canoe. It's like the Discovery Old Town 16 or 17 footer from Bass. Um, so shout out to Bass River Resorts out there. They've been providing canoes for us forever. Um, they're super great. Um, so when you're looking for a float trip partner um, down in the Ozarks, they're in Steelville off of Highway 8. Go check them out. Um, so everyone gets uh, one canoe per two people, and then you'll also get two or one PFD per person, and one paddle per person. Um, they're all canoe paddles. Some adventure races allow kayak paddles to be used, but here at the Castlewood Eight Hour, we only allow canoe paddles, and you have to use the ones that we provide just to make sure that uh, just trying to keep the playing field a little bit level. There's some like super fancy carbon paddles out there and they're just not allowed at our race just because it's beginner focused event. Um, so you're welcome to bring them and carry them with you around the course if you want, but you can't use them in the water. Um, so what will happen is um, you'll arrive in the transition area to get into your boats, um, either by bike or by foot. And um, you'll basically punch your passport uh, at the, with the volunteer, and then you'll grab one canoe per two people on your team. So two-person teams get one canoe, four-person teams get two canoes. Um, get your paddles, get your PFDs, um, and then carry them kind of to a spot near the river. Uh, big surprise, we're paddling on the Merrimack. Um, <laughs> but it just it gets really crowded in there. So. If there's anything that you need to do before you get in your boats, like put on a pair of pants or take your shirt or like a long sleeve shirt off or your, uh, your whole shirt off, I don't care. Um, anything that you need to do before you get in the boat, you should try to do it before you get really close <laughs> to the water just because there's going to be a ton of teams around um, and it's just a little bit busy. Um, and it's just not great if you, you know, you carry your canoe down there and you spend 20 minutes <coughs> changing your socks and zipping your coat up and all that stuff like it just clogs up the whole thing so anything that you need to do like that do that before you get close to or into the water um, and then um, so then when you'll you'll carry your boat down to the water um, get in you want to kind of describe launching from a from a riverbank or boat ramp yes 
Because normally how we do it is I paddle in the front and Earl paddles in the back. And so I just get in the boat and then magically we start paddling. So <laughs> this is the best way to <laughs> learn how to do it. It's that easy. It's Alice magic. is like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so taking the strongest paddler would be probably the best in the back. Good question. Um, so should the strongest paddler be in the back? It kind of depends. I would say the most confident paddler should be in the back. Not necessarily the strongest. Um, the person in front needs to be like your motor. Um, so all they do is just like paddle, 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 you know, paddle on one side, paddle on the other, go, 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 go. Um, and then the person in the back needs to be more confident with how to actually steer the canoe. Um, so that's how I would split it up. Usually it does happen that the stronger person is in the back, and that's fine, but I've paddled in the back before at this race because it's like my teammate was stronger like as a motor, and I was confident enough in the back of the boat, so it just kind of depends on each team. So getting in the water. The, the, best, the, the best thing is just first keep the boat going the way you, way you want it is the first you should bring and then there's certain people that will want to try to steer a boat from the front because they don't believe that the person in the back really knows what they're doing. That doesn't work real well either. Been there, done that, and everybody's working a lot harder than what you need to, and actually you're working against each other. So if you're in the front and you feel like the person in the back really might be not doing what you're wanting them to, talk it out versus trying to just paddle out up front and thinking that you're you're just going to make them work harder. So, so most of the steering is done in the back then? Steering is done in the back. And, uh, but you can help steer from the front through good communication of, you know, just we need to move the boat to the right, <coughs> a hard left, you know, three strokes or just call it out. Okay. Um, but, you know, when you're moving the boat, the best thing is to keep the communication open. And if you're in the back of the boat, or if you're the person with the map and you're like, we need to go this direction and you see a feature off in the distance, so you just tell the person about, hey, we need to go in that direction, aim for that uh, high point or that tree or that light out in the distance or whatever at night. Those type of little things really help those things. As far as launching goes, um, you know, okay, we're going to be paddling on the Merrimack. You might be off a beach, you might be off a boat ramp, um, or both. Um, boat ramps are interesting because they're going to be kind of tight, and you have the concrete slab, but then you also have the concrete barriers off the sides. The curbs. The curbs. Um, based on the water levels right now, um, you can see them, but you might take off down the middle and all of a sudden if you go too hard one direction you're going to all of a sudden be caught on one of the curbs so pay attention to those. If it's congested in the ramp don't be afraid to go off to one side or the other side. You know you're only going to put two or three boats down a ramp at a time. Um, and then the main thing is, is man, the, right now the flow is not too bad but it's still going to push a boat. So you know the thing is you have pink and green. Whoa. Okay. Amazing colors. Um, I love this how this reflects right in my head. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Just glowing in that screen. So people on Facebook enjoy that. It's an aura. It's an aura. Um, so you just want to be prepared when you put the boat in the water. And you, the, the front person, get them in, have them sit down before you launch. Um, when we see teams go in or tip over, the most the most common is at the launch point, just because it's kind of chaotic. You're not talking it out. You're not fully prepared to go. Um, but right now, the the flow in the Merrimack is pretty comfortable, so it shouldn't be crazy. But we're still three weeks out, and anything can happen. But hopefully, it stays. Right now, it's about perfect. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, the water levels stay about where they are. So this is what happens at a boat when a boat ramp meets the river. Most boat ramps are coming in at some sort of, I don't want to be like too geometry here, but we're going to talk perpendicular, so hope that's okay with everybody. So when the boat ramp is coming in at like a perpendicular uh, way here, like these are the curbs that Earl talked about, they're, you know, four to six inches higher 
than the actual concrete boat ramp itself. So when the water is flowing, you know, this is just the downstream flow, what's going to happen is there's going to be a little bit of an eddy here and a little bit of an eddy here. And so if you have your boat, let's say, here's your canoe, and you're putting it into the river, and you're trying to like shove out straight into the river, that water is going to immediately catch you and start pushing you downstream. So when you're getting into the boat, the front peer person kind of needs to be aware of what, you know, that the rear person is doing. Usually when we put in, um, I get in the boat first, I sit down, like, make sure it's all good, like, have my paddle ready. And then Earl kind of says, like, okay, I'm <coughs> pushing off, and he, you know, this is at least what I think happens. He has one foot in the canoe, <laughs> one foot on the shore, and just kind of gives a little push, and then almost immediately sits down. And then we're kind of, we have a little bit of momentum out into the middle of the river here. And then that's just going to gently turn us downstream. Um, where you get into trouble is if you're trying to go straight across and you start hitting the current this way with your boat and the current's hitting you this way, then it's going to make your boat do funny things. And if you're not prepared for it, it's just a little unsettling. So what you kind of want to do is get your boat ready to go and then just be prepared to turn with the current as soon as possible. The other thing is if there's, if there's space, this is a nice place right here to put in because you're protected and you don't have any really obstacles to get through. Um, but it just depends on when you show up and what's available at that time. But you know, ultimately, if you can put in back here, you just have a little more there. So these little pockets here, they're called eddies. It's just calm or slack water um, that doesn't have the current going with it down the stream. So there's just a little bit of, uh, they're like, they're great resting spots, especially like when you get into more advanced white water. Um, these little quiet pockets are really important to look for. Um, but they're great for just canoeing on a regular river like the Merrimack, just because they're good, you know, the current doesn't affect these little pockets as much. Um, so you can get in and kind of get set before you push off. Um, let's talk about keeping the boat even, like weighted. So another question is, I'm going to just keep going here. This is, thanks for finding this poster. Um, so another question is, how do you want your boat to travel in the water? Um, so now we're like looking at the sideways picture boat. So the ideal way to have your boat in the water is nice and even, like this. I hope I drew that pretty even. What you don't want, I'm going to draw this exaggerated, is someone really heavy in the front plowing into the water. This is a really slow and inefficient way to paddle. So if you have uh, some two paddlers that are very different weights, you want to be really careful about who sits where. The alternative is you have something like this. If you have the really heavy person in the back, then you can see how that's really not efficient either because you're going to lose some control because the front of the boat is going to be out of the water. It's going to be kind of wiggly. And um, you're also just not going to get the nice straight flow of the canoe as it goes through the water. So you ideally want to keep everything balanced so everything's pretty flat. Um, a good question about how to do that if you're if you're if you and your teammate are like 50 pounds different um, is look at all the available weight that you have with you. So your packs that probably have some water in them, whatever shoes you're wearing, uh, you know, pre pretty much whatever you're carrying, put with the lighter person. So. You know, if the lighter person is going to be in front, put a bunch of packs in front with them so that the boat evens out nice and trim like this. Um, and this can be, you know, we adjust these things too while we're paddling. Load up with rocks or something. Or rocks, yeah. <laughs> find a Don't, just the stuff that you need to carry. We're going to add a bunch of extra stuff just to balance it out. Yes, but, yeah, you know, it's just, it doesn't take much to move no. around. But, you know, you just want to keep the boat as level as possible, and, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, 
That's our that's our goal. <laughs> um, want to talk about? Yes. I know from Facebook pictures previous years you had people put bikes in the canoe. Is that possible? Ooh. Yeah. So I, that's a great question. Bikes and boats. I posted a little like teaser. spoiler teaser on Facebook this afternoon, morning. I don't even remember. Um, so last year we've had we had bikes and boats for like a quarter mile. It was basically a self ferry. Two years ago. Two years ago. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yep. Um, basically a self ferry <laughs> from one side of the river to the other. Um, and this year we are going to have bikes and boats for the entire. Paddle. So pretty excited. Everybody's um, just smiling. It's so <laughs> exciting. Everybody's happy about it. Yeah. Um, so we'll go through. Uh, we can talk through some techniques tonight too. A little bit. We'll do it also in the biking uh, session next week, next Monday. Um, but there's lots of, lots of different ways to pack your bikes into your canoe. Um, Pretty much everyone goes with taking the front wheel off. That's a pretty standard first step. And then, um, I'm just going to keep going with the visual aid tonight. So then the other options that you have are, let's see, we're just going to do like a cross section of the canoe. So this is like if you were in the back looking forward, you could put your bikes here, straight up and down and like do some sort of bungee around the tops of them so they kind of sit upright in the middle of the boat. That way, you know, you have your seats here and here. You have some thwarts. This is not a football. It's a canoe looking down on it. Um, then your bikes are kind of like here in the middle. Does that make sense? Um, another thing to do is take the front wheels off. Use your canoe again. Seats and thwarts. And then you actually uh, shimmy the bike underneath the thwarts of the canoe. So you have like, uh, the fork would be here, and I have to draw a bike. There we go. So the wheel, here's your pedals. And then you also slide the other wheel kind of like under here. Does that make sense? So you kind of like slide it into the bottom of the canoe for the first bike. And then the second bike usually can either fit underneath it with the first one or just on top of the ports, um, just resting on top. Okay, so my bike, you can't take the tire off unless you deflate the tire. Mm -hmm. So is there, um, can you just, you know, the best way, obviously, it would be to put it, like, upright, like, kind of bungee well, together? That yes. Is, I mean, there's so many ways you can do this. There's no good way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sort of so out. you just sort of. manage what's best and works for you. So you know, in your case, if we can, if you can slide the other bike kind of down in and just bunch yours on top. Okay. And then you know, there's certain there's certain bikes that they're small enough you don't have to take any wheels off and they'll just fall right in. Um, and then. For the person that has an XL frame, their life needs to be a little bit more challenging. Um, you know, so it's just whatever works. And the other thing is, is though, it's like, okay, now we got the bikes in their boats. Yay. Oh, yeah. Then you put the boat in, water, and you can't paddle without hitting your hand on the bike. So when you're putting the bike in the boat, you're like, okay, am I going to be able to also paddle this? Or, you know, when you're like this, and then you flip to the other side, and it's clunk. So, one other thing that Emily hasn't told you is, is since we're putting bikes in the boats, we did shorten paddle a little bit more. Okay. So, it's still a paddle, but we did take mile off or something. So, do we like need that. to bring, like, X number of bungees and straps to be prepared for this endeavor? Yes. Okay. It's Whatever. not like they're going to be in there. Yep. Okay, so whatever you feel comfortable with. I don't think we're going to mandate anything, but, you know, if you want a couple of lanyards or a couple of runners or a couple of the bungees with hooks, just something light because you can kind of carry them, you know? So I wouldn't go crazy with ratchet straps and heavy hooks, but, you know, just a couple of bungees or even just some climbing, just strength, you know? Because we just... Basically, is what happens. What you want is if that boat goes over, 
you don't want to lose your bike. You don't want to really lose your bike, otherwise it's going to be kind of a long rest of the race. Yes. <laughs> really long. <laughs> it's going to be a long walk. But, uh, yeah. And we will feel really bad. Right. So don't lose your bike. <laughs> well, the nice thing about the Merrimack, though, too, is if you do go over where, I mean, it's not super good. you're going to float down a little bit, and you're going to be able to put your feet down. So, um, but, you know, we just really want you to start the paddle with your bike and end the paddle with your bike. And, you know, and it's something you know it wouldn't be a bad idea if you have access to a canoe or if you have a neighbor that has a canoe or whatever, just to go try to do it. And then maybe next week we'll get a boat and a Well we I mean we have a canoe on the floor now too, don't we? Yeah, I don't yeah, we can I can Well I'm just saying like if you wanna just bring your bikes here to the Alpine shop and ask, Hey, can we uh, practice with the canoe that's on the floor? <laughs> like that's a great idea. Or we got the demo boats outside or something. Yeah. You know, it's like... Like, come on in. If you don't own a canoe, just practice taking your bike apart to the, you know... Nor most bikes, you can get them in with just your front wheel off. Um, and, you know, I've also paddled with bikes in the boats with not taking anything apart. Just flop them on the top. It's kind of like you need to be a good paddler to do it because it makes your bike a little bit more... Or your boat a little bit unstable because um, the center of gravity is higher. But you're confident with it it's super fast and you get gone and out of the way of the rest of the teams use it the vertical placement it's a little more uh, it's actually it's like this but you don't even take anything apart oh gotcha you just okay. so they're just plank, the bike yeah. over. they're basically pancaked on top of the on top of the just, yeah. just lay them do one one way do one the other way and so you, they're just going to be sticks sitting up a little bit higher so your opportunity of them being in the way when you're paddling is a little bit higher but it all depends on how you lay them in. Does the vertical uh, position seem a little top heavier than, than that uh, one under the... Again, it's going to be an obstacle every time you're yeah. doing this. You're going to have to flip over the back of a, a rear wheel or a handle. And this, kind of, this configuration depends on where the thwarts in the canoe are. So if there's... Some of the canoes have three. You know, so if there's three of them, you might not be able to fit your bike in there. Um, but if there's just one or two, then you can usually just set them in there pretty nice. Um, so a little bit of experimentation makes for great photos. Um, we're going to have a river safety team out there uh, by Team River Runner. So if there are any issues, like, we'll be ready to help you. Um, and, yeah. Is it typical that it will be going after checkpoints as you paddle? Good question. Um, we've kind of, the question is, so do we, are there going to be checkpoints on the paddle, essentially? Yeah. Um, we kind of go back and forth every year, and usually it's either zero or one or two. And they're not difficult. They're mostly to just, like, keep you looking forward to something. <laughs> um, so, you know, by adding the difficulty of putting bikes in the boats, we do everything we can to make the rest of the paddle as straightforward and simple as possible. Um, just to make sure everything, everyone makes it to the other side and they don't hate us. And they can hate us a little bit, but not a lot. Um, any other questions? Bikes and boats? One note for the family teams, mostly if anyone's watching. Um, the family teams, we are arranging for a bike shuttle for you. So you if it's free. If you, yeah, if you need it, if you have three people, um, we're going to help you get your bikes to the takeout location. Um, so you won't have to fit three people and three bikes in one canoe. Um, They're the only exception. That's the only <laughs> exception. And if any of you guys want to switch to a family team, you have to find a related person under 18 to race with you. Or have you can, a baby right away. Or have a child, <laughs> like, fast, yes. A 14-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, do you want to go through, like, can you paddle and Got that paddle? Yep. Can you Oh, yes. Yes, you do. Oh, wait, will you go back? You didn't talk about how you do your lawn shawl. Oh, I do my lawn shop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
she said what she th she thinks that. Oh, magic. well, it's, it's just magic. It's magic. <laughs> it is magical because yesterday when we paddled, it was a little bit cold. We both wanted to keep our feet dry, so you work a little extra, a little bit extra hard. So, it is, so we had the we actually took off from a boat launch. The boat was pointing straight out, and so we did what you guys are going to be doing. Maybe not at the same spot, but we did it. We had two, no bicycles. We had no. We had our oh, bikes. We had our bikes. We had our oh. bikes in the boats mm -hmm. because we need to do all this on our own. So we need to go paddle and get back to where we started, or just whatever we end up doing, we end up doing. Um, so we had us two bikes <coughs> and all basically what you would need for an adventure. PFDs, race. PFDs, paddles, packs. packs, the whole thing. So Emily's in the front, boats loaded, loaded up pointing straight out, and I just have it to where just the very back of the boat is on the landing, and just kind of step in and push out, and we just push the boat straight out, and then she's ready to paddle, we need to put a little bit of power to it to get out in the middle, you just get out a little ways, and then it's like, okay, you need to start your watch, or you need to do those things. Get away from shore so you're past the obstacles, and then just do your thing as you go down. Um, but you know, the least amount of time you want to get down to the water, be organized, get in the boat, get out in the water, and then if you need to open up a code or zip up a code or whatever. But we need you before you launch. PFD has to be on. PFDs have to be on the whole duration of you being on the water. That is mandatory. Because it's going to be cold, potential of hypothermia, and you know, if you go in the water, you just, no matter where we do adventure racers, it's, it's always mandatory to be on. It's just a safe thing. And when it's cold, it's just another layer of uh, no, protection. So. Is that yeah. kind yeah. of, Good. you know, we don't. Have, we kind of have a unicorn in the front of the boat. It just kind of all magically happens. There's glitter that follows yes. us. <laughs> just kidding. No, no glitter. So, yeah, we did paddle upstream a little bit I mean, yesterday too. That was tough. There was no glitter in the unicorn. That <laughs> you won't be doing that. Sweat so. and red vision. But, At uh, least not for far. If not we for make far. It. So, um, how to paddle? How to paddle? So, I'm normally in the back, but. You know, this is going to be very sim similar to the, the paddle that you guys will have um, for the race. It's just your normal Bass River float paddle. Um, normally they have a yellow blade and a red shaft, and they're all about the same. There's going to be some that are taller that are shorter, but just find one that works for you. But normally on something like this, the top hand over the top, and then just kind of in this comfortable range, and then you're just going to, you know, want to reach forward, pull back, and you're going to want to use, it's, a lot of people just try to paddle arms and shoulders, but your whole torso is so much stronger, so it's like, you can just, it's hard to do this standing up, but it's like, you want to use, you know, use your full body to, you know, it's just hard for me to do all this. Uh, you can do it. But, we believe in you. <laughs> Oh, like you have the coolest shoes of the day. Yes. Those are river shoes. Those are paddling. Well, they're lawn mowing shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but you, it's what, you know, you're going to be up like this, and you just want to, you know, you're going to reach forward and then back. So you're using this torso, and then, you know, reach forward, and then this is about, this is your power, and then once you get past here, you kind of lost that power. So it's a long time I'm using a straight paddle, but you know, like this, <laughs> you know, and then, then you're going to just flip over and, you know, and then for the front and back people, some people do it different ways up, you know, it's like, it's good to just keep switching side to side, so you, one side doesn't get tired, but, you know, and it also just depends on where you need the steering. So some people are 
uh, they like just kind of talk about it before the race. They're like, okay, we're gonna do five strokes on one side, switch five strokes on the other side, and they just do that for the majority of the event. Um, some people are a little bit more like free flowing and are like, all right, we're gonna paddle on the right side, and then we're gonna have a like cue word that means we switch. The common paddling canoe word is hup. If you want to <laughs> use that, so you know, going along, and the person in the back says hup, and then you switch. Do. Of course, I'm like, you know, using your torso, not just like your arms and wrists and stuff. Um, and then you say hop again, and then you switch. So um, that's another option. Uh, or you could just, you know, ignore the person in the back and just, just you know, be determined to paddle on your one side, which is not going to be that great for the team. Um, what other strategies? Um, but, you know, I guess... The, the fast paddlers, they're switching quite frequently, just to keep. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> so, uh, they switch quite frequently, but, you, you know, has everybody paddled a boat that's in the room? <laughs> yeah? Okay. So, it's kind of like, whatever works best for you is the best. Questions? Are are you uh, as part of the? If I'm getting you off task, mm -hmm. is navigation something that um, the front person would be more likely to do, or back person? Yeah, great question. So uh, you know, this is. It, it's all such a like mixing bowl of everybody's individual strengths and weaknesses. Um, but in general, all other things being equal, the person who's navigating should be in the front um, just for the pure purpose of it's easier to see up there. Um, but if, you know, it's like if your stronger navigator is also your more confident paddler or perhaps your heavier person, you might want to put them in the back. Um, and then it's just really key to make sure that both people in the boat understand what the goals are. Um, so when we, when Earl and I paddle together, uh, I don't typically navigate for the team, but sometimes I do, and then I'm in the front. So we talk a lot about, uh, you know, where we're going, how far it is. I always like to say, you know, we're going to paddle for 2K or 10K or whatever the distance is, just so people can kind of get that in your brain. Um, I don't know about you guys, but it's, it's like you're on a car trip, and it's like, are we there yet? Nope, it's going to be a while. Are we there yet? Nope, a little bit more. Are we there yet? Nope, just a little bit more. And it's like after the sixth time of that, you don't really want to be on a team with that person. So just like really communicate about what your objectives are. Um, we also use the, like, clock system, so uh, if there's a stick up on my right hand side, I'll say, oh, there's a stick at 2 o'clock, or there's a stick at 1 o'clock, or, you know, wherever that stick is, um, or, wow, there's a really cool bird at 9 o'clock, or, you know, whatever it is, just to help kind of direct everybody's attention, um, and, yeah, it's just really calling out you know, constant communication um, to what is what your goal is with starting the paddle, and then as you proceed, you know, marking off landmarks, like, great, we passed that river bend, um, we passed that gravel bar, like, just something like that to help the navigation go along. Yeah, one of the big, th one of the big things is, is for the person in the front of the boat to make sure that you call out, you know, deadfall in the river, or if you're getting in shallow water, because the person in the back can't always see everything that you see in the front. Um, so just be attuned to call those things out. Don't be afraid to yell loud because if it's windy and, you know, I'm always going, what? Because Emma's talking forward, but I'm behind. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's just one of those things where... <coughs> When you're talking to somebody and you're in front of them, they can't always hear. So you need to talk a little bit louder, and especially if there's something in the water. The other thing is, is sometimes the front, the first, the first 
person in the front doesn't see that obstacle, the person in the back didn't see that obstacle, the next thing you know the boat is stuck on that obstacle. So what do you do when the boat's stuck on an obstacle and you haven't tipped it over yet? Anybody care to chime in on that one? Back up. <laughs> First thing is, is just to relax and not grab the sides of the boat and tense up because then most likely you are going to tip over. So it's like if you're in a pause point, point and something hasn't gone over, it's just like, okay, just do a check and it's like, okay, let's talk through this if we have a moment before it is. And, you know, if it's as simple as just a couple backstrokes, great. If it's as simple or the person in the front needs to, like, step out and push you back or whatever it is, it's just, but is it, if you come into that rock or you come into that, if you're wedged up against that tree or whatever it is, as soon as you panic, grab the sides of the boat or quit paddling or whatever it is, you're more apt to tip over. And you probably have dropped your paddle in the river. So now you're like double in a bad spot. Um, so like whenever we're going into water that's a little bit ripply or fast, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, it's like it's a really hard human instinct to fight. Like when you're scared, you want to like grab onto something solid, but uh, it's when you're paddling, like that's like Earl said, that's just the worst thing you can do. You just you give up your opportunity to control your boat. So when you're a little bit nervous, it's like you just need to channel some Nemo and just keep paddling, just keep paddling. Like, and it's surprising, like the. The water will help you stay upright, stay in your boat, and keep going forward when you like really dig in with your paddle. Um, like we, you know, we've just been through some really splashy stuff, and as long as you keep paddling, keep looking where you're going, um, and keep your boat at least trying to control it, you're just going to be so much farther ahead than giving up, holding onto your boat, and letting the river do whatever it wants. Um, so you're not going to be in any, like, <laughs> I don't really even think we have a class one rapids out there. Maybe maybe you have. Um, but, if there, I mean, there's a couple spots where there's some rocks or there's some trees underwater. So you do need to pay attention. Um, and it's just constant communication. Keep paddling. Um, and then you'll be fine. Yeah, I would say the biggest obstacle that you are going to encounter is a bend in a river and there's dead fall, and the current is blowing a little bit faster. So it's like, just aim the boat, not at that. Um, but sometimes you end up there, and then it's like, okay, how do we get out? Because it happens. So speaking of a bend in a river, um, if we were talking back on geometry, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, right? So if you're trying to get from the bottom of the page, the river's flowing this way. If you're trying to get from here to here, you kind of want to hug the inside of the curve if you were in a geometry class. Um, but when you're on the river, it's a little bit different. The fat, you want to look where the current is going and how that's going to carry you the fastest way. So the fastest part of the current is actually on the outside of the river bend. So when you're, when you're paddling this way through the river, the best way to go is outside of the curve outside of the curve to outside of the curve just like that so that you can really catch and use help the current work with you instead of paddling in this slack water that isn't going to give you any speed boost if you're on the inside so it's shallower on the inside slower water on the inside um, it's just it doesn't help you any it doesn't hurt you because it probably is not going backwards but you're going to just be really a lot faster when you're paddling with the current and using that for your, for your advantage. And then uh, Earl kind of talked about trees. So I think I'm going to do one more visual aid here. Quick, quick question on yeah. the channel. Mm -hmm. Is there, it seemed like I would heard at one point there a lot of times in the main current there's a trail of bubbles. Oh, uh, the bubbles. Yep. Okay, all right. Totally. It just looks like... Uh, a little bit of laundry detergent floating down, you know, it just has a little bit of white fuzz to it. And, you know, uh, in certain parts of the river, it's very apparent. Other parts, it just kind of dissipates. But, yes, it's where there's good good flow, it's like just kind of keep an eye out for the bubbles. And, you know, 
that isn't, you know, and if the other thing is, is you have a high side and a shallow side. So where the gravel bars are, that's where there's less current. Where there's the cut of the river, that's the faster, faster moving part. So you just kind of look, look for the bubbles and then look for the sharp cut that's traditionally your faster one. So one other thing with uh, submerged obstacles, these could be like uh, boulders, down trees. There's you know some railroad cars that are in the Merrimack that most of them are on the bank, but like you never really know what's going to be in a river. Um, so some of these things you can see, like the down trees will have the branches sticking out, you know, into um, above the river, above the water level. Um, so those are going to be easy to see and call out, and in general you just want to give those things kind of a wide berth, um, just because you're not, you're not really sure what the rest of the tree is doing. If you can see one branch, there's a pretty good chance there's going to be a couple other branches close to it under the water, so if there's branches sticking up, you just want to avoid them in general. Um, but sometimes the obstacles are below the water level, so you can't see them, but the water will do different things depending on what's underneath. Um, and that's how you can tell what you're paddling into. So if there's like a rock or maybe a tree that's underwater, the river is going to go like this around it. Kind of these V's. And so there's going to be like a little riffle or a, like a really tiny little rapid that'll kind of show like, oh, there's something underneath the water close to the surface that's causing the water to do a little ripple. And then that ripple creates this V going, so the current's going this way here again. Um, so that ripple is going to create this V leaving the obstacle. So when you're paddling this way, you might just see this V kind of appear on the river, on the water's surface. And that can tell you, okay, there's something right below the surface that I want to avoid. So you can kind of see that these paddling along this way, if you're paddling along this way, you want to stay, you know, like, this is kind of the faster way because it's the outside of the bend, but there are these two obstacles here, so you kind of want to stay away from those and just go right through the middle that way. Um, so that's the basic, biggest thing with reading the river. Um, anytime you see little, you know, either trees sticking out above the water line or these little ripples that create the V's. Um, make sure you communicate that to your teammate in the front of the back of the boat whenever you see it. Kind of describe if it's 1 o'clock or 11 o'clock or where it is on the river. And then you can kind of, you know, Earl and I talk about it, like when we see a bunch of stuff, like if there's four trees, we're like, okay, we're going to shoot to the, in the middle of the second and the third tree or, you know, just kind of have a game plan so that you don't get there and it's too late to change, you know, to create a plan and get around those things. That's all I got for paddling, I think. Any questions? Uh, so back on the navigation thing, yeah. mm -hmm. through the whole day, or terrain-based day, I guess it's mm -hmm. go wherever you need to go mm -hmm. to get to the controls. Yes. Uh, is there, for, I assume here you want all the canoes to come out at the same place, yep. so it wouldn't be that case where it's like, okay, we're going to jump out of the canoe here and start our land trip. Um, there, so there's a very clear exit yes. point that we're looking for? Yeah, okay. so um, anything can happen between the put-in and the takeout, um, but we will tell you, you must put your boat in the river here, and you must take it out here. Okay. Um, so there could be an intermediate biking section or running section or trekking section that you could choose oh. where to beach the boat. Um, so that'd be kind of cool. I mean, rather than go to the sort of the designated endpoint of the paddle and then go backtrack to it, you could beach the boat ahead of time. And you go could, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we will be very clear about where we want you to start and where we want you to end, mostly to make it easy on bass so they're not collecting <laughs> canoes from a six-mile chunk of the Merrimack. Um, so can you like can you beat your boat before the end? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And if you know if you're but paddling, you, but you oh. still you can if you deem necessary. Okay. But at the end of the paddle section, we need your boat turned in 
at the pad I'll take. So you have to get, if you abandon it early, you have to get back to it to continue to take it. Yes, yeah. yeah, so you can't, just, down you can't just say, oh, it'd be so much faster to beach the boat okay. here, and then we'll run to there. No. <clears throat> you need to get the boat. It'll be very cut and dry on race day of what you need to do. Um, there's just a lot of different options in how a, a adventure racing course is laid out. So Emma's giving you examples, but basically, when we put you out on the paddle section, you start with your boat. When you're done with the paddle section, wherever that point is, we need you, your bikes, your boat, your paddle, and PFDs to take out at that designated spot. Just, just to, not to belabor the point, but yeah. so <laughs> hypothetically, paddling for the put in is five miles upstream from the takeout place, mm -hmm. and you happen to notice there's a control 100 yards off the bank, two miles down from where you put in. You could beach the boat, run over, hit the control, come back to your boat and finish the paddle. Assuming that that point <laughs> was in play on the paddle. Okay. If that point is not in play on the paddle, then no. No, okay. And that will be clearly indicated. That will be clearly, yes. clearly noted on race day as well. There are certain races, it won't be this one, where it's like there's an array of checkpoints and you can get them by any means, boat, by paddle. So that is definitely yeah. options in other races that you know we could provide to you at some point in time with the Castlewood race or another adventure race where I call it pick your poison. It's like, you know, however you want to go get these, you can. Uh, keeps life super exciting and it really generates a lot of different strategy and sleepless nights trying to figure out how you're going to do that one. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, and the thing is, is with this race, it's going to be very obvious of where you put in and where you take out because we want the boats we're trying to make our lives easy. That's right. And those are on the map. And we're or trying to make put them on there. Hmm? And those are on the, the put in and the takeout will be on the map ahead of time. Oh, yeah. We're going to have photographers and we're going to have all kinds of happy people there cheering you on so you'll know where it is. Where it is. Where yeah. it is. Oh, but it'd be on the map, too. Uh, oh, yeah. you do, well, you, we'll give you the coordinates tonight. Before. Okay, got it. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, it'll be very well marked, but also there's some races where you do where you come in the middle of the night. You really don't know if you're at the right pile takeout. <laughs> For this one, it's going to be pretty awesome. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so we're just going to run through the clothing, the gear list for clothing, and just some of our other personal recommendations about what to wear. Um, actually, I think that an eight-hour adventure race in December is like one of the hardest races to prepare for as far as clothing goes, um, just because you have the temperatures could be zero. I really hope they're not zero, but they could be. And like last year at the finish line, the temperatures were 60 degrees. So there's just a really wide range of available weather. Um, it could be raining, it could be snowing, it could be sleeting, we don't know. Um, and then you're just gonna be doing a variety of activities. So your heart rate's gonna change all through the race. There are gonna be some parts of it where you're like gasping and out of breath because you're working so hard. And then there's gonna be some parts where you're like waiting for your teammates to eat their snack and it's gonna, you know, your heart rate's gonna drop and you're gonna get cold. So um, there's just, you just need to be kind of prepared for a lot of different situations. Um, this is a good one to kind of have a chat with your team before the race, like, okay guys, are we like gonna pin it and sprint the whole thing? That clothing situation is gonna be a lot different than we're gonna hike the, all of the foot sections, we're going to take it easy and we're going to just get a couple checkpoints and then go to the finish line. Um, both strategies we encourage, like we just want you out there, but you just need to be aware like the sprinting teams are going to wear a lot less clothes. They're going to basically wear the bare minimum on the mandatory gear list versus if you're out for hike, they're going to want maybe an, even a neck, two fleeces and even though there's only one on the gear list. Um, so Real quick for hats, I'm actually, this is a totally acceptable hat. Everyone, the racers and volunteers, will get one of these in their packets on Friday night. Reversible, you can have uh, white or green. 
I'm not going to take my hat off on live Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, a buff is okay too. That's this amazing uh, like tube of fabric. It's not like a closed up hat, um, but you can fold it in half and wear it as a headband, or you can create a hat out of it or a neck gaiter. Anything that you can use. Oh, yeah, here's the other option. Um, anything that you can use to create some sort of heat retention on your head is what we count as a hat, but not a baseball cap. Sorry. Um, uh, for the long sleeve base layer top, this is just something that can be worn next to skin that will help insulate uh, you during cold parts of the race. So paddle, um, if you're going at a slower pace, you might wear this the whole time. Uh, a bike jersey or a short sleeve t-shirt plus arm warmer is also, is also acceptable for this item of clothing. Basically just want some sort of long sleeve top that will be your insulating or base layer. Um, we also want you to have a fleece long sleeve top. Um, we've got a couple examples. I really like to have like a quarter zip or even a full zip is kind of nice. Um, just because it allows you to regulate your temperature throughout the day. So like, I might start, if this was gonna be, this isn't really a fleece, this is more of a base layer, but say this was my fleece, starting the race, I would probably wear it zipped up like this, and then like five minutes into whatever the race part, you know, the first section is, I would probably unzip it, cause like we're already working really hard. And then it always seems when you get off the paddle, no matter how hard you're working on the paddle, when you get out of the boats, you're cold. Like, just expect it and plan for it. So you get out of the boats like, oh, I'm cold again. And then say you're running again, and now it's like, oh man, I'm hot. So it's like, just really important to have some sort of zipper or like heat adjustment system. A full zipper is great if you're a person that gets really hot. Um, so some sort of fleece uh, insulating layer. If you have questions about it, bring it to us at one of the AR 101 classes or gear check. Like, we have people bring stuff in at, um, or I meant packet pickup, you know, the night before the race, like, hey, does this count as a fleece? And I've told people no, because they're trying to get away with some, like, super lightweight, non-fleece item. So do you check our, our gear? We do, yep. So what, 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 do we, like, have it in a clear plastic thing, or do we just, like, vomit it all out on the table for you to see, or Both, what happens? We see everything. Okay. <laughs> um, so some... Uh, some point in the race, we will have a gear check. Oh. It's not before oh, the race. Oh, it's just a random checkpoint out there that random will show up. Points. And, uh, yeah, so keep your on your toes. And don't put your <laughs> weed in there. Oh, don't ditch it before you leave it. Right. Because well, theoretically, if you check at the beginning, you could just throw everything in the weeds. I mean, yeah. if somebody wanted to violate the rules. You could. Yes, you could. Anyway, yep. So the thing is, it's like, we oh. put, the reason we have a mandatory gear <laughs> list is because if you, we want you to have all the tools that you need to be successful and not get <laughs> hypothermic or whatever it is. Because it's like, with all the things that we have on that gear list, rain pants, fleece, all that kind of stuff, as long as you keep moving, you should be able to stay warm enough to get to a safe spot. If you don't have those items, you know, it just it reduces those things for most people. So it's for your own safety. Right. And so it's like, we might not look at everything, but you might get to a certain spot and they might want to say, okay, we need to see a compass, your hat, and a red flashy light. You might get to another spot and they're going to say, okay, we need a whistle and your hydration. Keeping it simple, but it's just going to keep it to where, you know, um, or we might do it at the end of the race too. You don't, you don't know um, where we're going to them um, but it just when we first started the bench racing it was like every race you went to they had a gear check before you started but then it's like well who's to say that they're not gonna you know so everybody's kind of gone to for efficiency of checking in gets the teams through a lot faster but it also is like you don't know when you're gonna they're gonna ask you thing it's like you want to make sure you have the right stuff when you're on the court. So if anything is in question, bring it Friday and we can say yes or no. And or email or, email or whatever. put it on our Facebook event page. Like, 
any any kind of question, we're here to help you answer it. Because um, it's also not really fair on the volunteers to be like, I swear, this is my fleece. And it's like a toddler size <laughs> fleece <laughs> vest. Like, no. Like, we have good volunteers, but we don't want to make them make that, you know, if there's like a borderline call, it's like, it's not on them to make that call, it's on us. So we want to help you make that before the race. I've passed one of those before, and it was the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> With a toddler size fleece? Yeah, I, I had it, it was a youth one, and we cut it here, we cut it here, and it was 110 degrees in the parking lot, and I'm like, yeah, that's what you like to do, that's great. 30 degrees nights, it was cold. So it's kind of like, it seemed like a really smart thing to do at the time, but it was, I would not do that again. Smart arts. Hmm? Smart arts. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It was all about trying to save weight. Yes. So you're going to talk about rain pants, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. You want to talk about this next? Yes, please. Okay. Rain pants. Da -da. Normally, we have a lot of different options. Um, we got these guys. So any type of water, they're going to advertise as waterproof, and we all know like nothing is really 100% waterproof, but anything that says, hey, I'm a waterproof pant, that's what we mean by rain pants. Um, I think we called it, yeah, waterproof pants. Um, so there's a bunch of different styles out there, um, but ideally what you, you want to look for is some sort of zipper or button opening at the bottom that's wide enough where you can put it on with whatever shoes you're gonna be wearing, either your bike shoes or your running shoes, um, just so they're still easy. Faster. It's still faster to take your shoes off. You try to think, you think you're gonna put your shoes through this. I can do it pretty fast. I know, but you're magical. <laughs> so, you know, this is just your basic. Um, so going on, do you have a like, specific question about them or? Uh, so you're, is, if I have something that I believe is rain pants, mm -hmm. uh, you will accept them or not. Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> Are they rain pants? Yeah. Well, I mean, do, does, how much do you believe in them? When water, <laughs> well, when water hits them, does water fall off of it? Or does it well, for a them? while, maybe. I mean, are they from but the Sandies? Well, maybe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they just lost their waterproofing ability. Yeah, they just don't. Yeah, they're just, sure they're yeah these are... I mean, my rain pants that are like, you know, they're advertised as rain pants, waterproof pants. Like, you sit in them for an hour in the canoe, and they're they don't hold the rain out. Right. Like what you would ride. Right. You guys do a long ride. Mine were still beating up this. Well, Ooh. you know what Ted does. <laughs> right. His rain pants are is a jar of Vaseline. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure that doesn't count, but it is quite heavy, so it's not a good yeah. idea. Anyway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so going along with the rain pants, uh, we also require a waterproof jacket. Um, so same thing, you just want something that fits you. Um, we like to recommend a hood just to give you another option for heat regulation. So hood on at the beginning of the race when it's cold, hood off when you're hotter. Um, we've got yeah. One thing that's nice about a hood is for the person that's in the front of a canoe, they normally get traditionally wetter than the person in the back of the canoe just because of the splash. So if you're in the front of the canoe, have a rain jacket. If it's cold, have a rain jacket. Even if it's on the outside of your PFD, you just put it on there over the top of your PFD. Put up a put your hood up just to keep the water from draining down the back of your neck. That's the worst feeling ever. It's cold water splashing down the back of your neck, especially for however long you're piling. The other thing is, is a shower cap, just the 50 cent hotel shower caps. So we normally carry those with us in what we call our bailout bags of emergency stuff. A little, one of those shower caps can really help contain heat when you're paddling or inside of a bicycle helmet, something like that. So it's just one of those things that doesn't weigh anything, but the advantage of things go south are huge. Uh, okay, we kind of skipped a little bit, but I'm going to go back to wool or synthetic long pants. Um, so this is just basically your base layer bottom. It can be uh, wool or synthetic long underwear. It can be uh, your 
you're going to wear like a triathlon bike short and some sort of full leg warmer. It can be a pair of trekking pants, like, you know, like a lightweight hiking pant. It can be a fleece legging, um, just something that covers your entire leg and will help keep you warm if you fall into the river, um, is what we're going for. So um, it's not your rain pant. Correct. Okay. Yep. It, just to be clear, it's yep. something else. Something yes. Else. Yep. Your rain pants and your wool synthetic long pants are two items. Um, you did say full-length leg warmers are yep. acceptable. For yep. Uh -huh. As long as you wear shorts with them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Well, you know Vaseline will be fine. All yeah. the yeah. way to You'll just be covered in Vaseline. That'll be really great. Right. Yeah. It'll be really slick. What I would like normally wear on my bottom for this yeah. race is I'd wear like a triathlon style bike short and then uh, like tights over it, and that would be my you know my whole base layer you know full synthetic long pant, and then I'd bring my rain pants in my pack. Maybe I'd put them on at the beginning or in the pattern. Um, but that's kind of what I would wear on the bottom. And then for the top, what I would wear, uh, I mean, it's just so varied depending on what the temperature is, but for kind of a normal, like, 30-degree castlewood, I'd probably wear uh, my long sleeve base layer top probably the whole time. Um, I'd have my fleece in my pack, and then I'd use my rain jacket throughout the race. Um, and then just have the fleece as, like, a backup if things go wrong. Um, gloves or mittens, something covering your hands. Um, this is, it's just, again, so personal. Some people have, like, really hot hands, and they just need, like, a thin little glove, and they're good to go. Some people, like me, get really cold on my hands, so I want, like, multiple pairs of mittens to wear in case one gets wet or sweaty or something like that. Um, the lobsters are really great for biking. So these are kind of a heavier duty biking glove um, that split you up so you can kind of stay a little bit warmer but also bike or break and shift. Um, but if you're a really warm handed person, you might just need a thin glove and you're good to go. Um, it's really up to your person, but you just have to have something that covers your hands for your mandatory gear. Um, and then another good thing to have, it's not mandatory, but some chemical hand or foot warmers are really handy. Um, I used these on Saturday. We were out for, I don't know, like six hours or something. At least, like, my feet were happy the whole day. So um, I used to, like, not like these because I feel like they're single-use and, like, wasteful. But if you use them in the right circumstances, they just keep you happy the whole day. So an option. Not mandatory. Um, okay, that's pretty much it for mandatory clothing. Any other questions for clothing or any other gear questions? Yeah. So you say hat, and that's what you mean. Yep. Not that. Right. That would not. Be oh, a not a baseball I'm cap. Just at Correct. Hat. Oh, yeah, because we just can't like. I mean, half of them have the mesh in the back. Right, right, right. Like, uh, you know, but you know, but basically, a cycling skull cap or okay. something like that is going to be your best case. You basically, you know, one of the really fun ski hats with a big ball on it. It's going to be hard to wear with your cycling helmet. So it's but just basically. Synthetic hat. A warm thing, not a yep. sunny thing. Yep. Correct. So like, you know, yep. Skull caps are the best or something like that. Um, talk about thoughts. Yep. The shorts thing is, uh, you know, I guess triathlon is short because they're lighter chamois. I'm just picturing like a, predominantly a cyclist. And, Running around with cycling shorts on is like a diaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, normally, Sweaty, messy. normally for yeah. shorter races for us, would be 24 hours or less. We want to try yeah. short, just because uh, the chamois is a chamois when you're cycling, but it's not. If you're paddling or you know if you're really sweaty, it's not a chamois that's super in the way. For long races, when we're doing you know all expedition races, we're either wearing just regular short, or then you change into a, what we call real deal cycling shorts. Right? Cycling for short stuff, you know, either a try short is your best thing, because you don't have that shammy issue yeah. to work around. And we, this is probably a good point. We haven't really addressed it, but like we don't provide 
changing tents or anything like that on the course. So do you feel the need to change clothes? Like you need to take care of that, not in the public areas. So run into the woods if you're changing. Um, like certainly can, I know everyone can do it respectfully. So just take care of that, but we don't provide any you know, this is not Iron Man. We don't have tents and volunteers to take your <laughs> clothes and put your socks and shoes on. Like, not our style. It's just you're out there kind of on your own. Um, Speed to street. Yes. Any other questions? Typically for this, for this, like, eight hours of racing, I would not typically bring a pair. Um, but... You know, I've also used it, like me personally, I really like to have something, like for a cold or like if it's a wet race, I always like to have something that's in my pack that's like my comfort item. Um, so it, it could be a pair of socks that's like, okay, if it gets really bad, I know I have this dry pair of socks that I can put on. Or if it gets really bad, I have this dry buff that I can put on. Or you know, So I always kind of like to have something like comforty. Um, so if that, like, I mean, that really helps me kind of stay motivated to push through when it's uncomfortable, so. So if, 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 if something like that makes you happy, which a dry pair of socks on a cold December day, coming off a paddle and having a dry pair of socks to put on might be a very nice thing to have, to protect them. Put them in a couple Ziploc bags, put them in a dry bag. You just put on your brand new fancy dry socks in your backpack, you're probably just carrying around a wet pair of socks for, for fun. So if they're a prize, treat them like a prize and protect them so that when you really want to cash that chip in, that they're real. Or if it's a Snicker bar or Skittles or whatever makes you happy. What else? Did you talk about shoes last week a little bit? Yep. Some people go, with bike shoes, but it just seems intuitively like just popping some platform pedals on the bike and using the trail running shoes. Yeah. This kind of common thing for this. Type. Yeah, I've actually kind of adjusted my perspective on clipless mountain biking shoes versus flat trail runners, um, mostly because the experience Earl and I had racing the summer with a couple from Wisconsin who uses doesn't matter what three hour race, three day race, they always use trail running shoes and flat pedals. Then they have a little like power grip, uh, like straps on the pedals. And honestly, I thought when we started racing with them that I would be able to see, like they wouldn't be as fast on the bike. And they're like just as fast on the bike as me and Earl with our clipless mountain biking shoes. So um, I just think like at really high end mountain biking that the you know, the clipless shoe does give you that power advantage, but for adventure racing, I think it's like a very viable option to have flat pedals and just wear the same pair of shoes the whole time. Certainly lighter weight, faster in transition, um, and not really a huge speed penalty. Well, just a more common, I guess. I've noticed that one drawback about Real rigid self cycling shoes is the feet don't move so much and they get cold easier. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even on a even if you're pedaling with softer shoes and your foot bends around the pedal a little bit, that helps keep you. Your feet would definitely stay warm wearing a pair of trail shoes versus a set of cycling shoes. Yeah. And then, you know, the other thing is easy if you're, you're dead set on cycling shoes and it's 20 degrees on, what are you looking at? You're looking at either a winter boot or a cycling shoe and of some sort to make it a viable mm -hmm. option, at least for me, because my feet can cold so fast. What else? 8.15, good to go. Lowe's already tucked in, ready for bed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Well, Earl and I are going to stick around like we always do. Um, see you later. I'll catch up on some Facebook comments here. Um, let's see. Oh, awesome. Lisa, thank you so much for answering all these questions. Okay, I think we're good. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching. 
See you later. Bye.